This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and I hereby declare a moratorium on all spoofs, satires, parodies, deconstructions, perspective flips, and any other quirky retellings of fairy tales. I'm sorry to have to do this, but we cannot risk another movie like our next offender, Charming. Look, the fractured fairy tale thing has had a good long run, but at this point the whole idea has become almost as routine as the original fairy tales themselves. I mean, here, even Disney seems to be doing it more often than not these days, so it's not like it's anything bold and original. Especially when you have a movie like this one, which is clearly drawing on the Shrek formula. Take a familiar folktale character or ten, add a couple twists, throw in a few anachronisms and pop culture references, and voila! A movie that the whole family can loathe together. And so it is that we must, regretfully, examine the case of Charming. This is the untold true story of the most famous prince the world has ever known. If it's anything like some of the other untold stories that have come before this court, we are in big trouble. The basic premise is that the charming prince who woke up Sleeping Beauty, found Cinderella's slipper, and pulled Snow White out of the glass coffin are all in fact the same prince, Felipe Charming to be exact. I hate to tell you, but Sondheim got there first. I was raised to be charming, not sincere. As a result, all three princesses are engaged to wed the same guy, and despite royals being something of a tight-knit lot, they are hilariously, for certain values of the term, unaware of the fact. I'm marrying a prince. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's a prince of a guy or whatever, but my beloved? He's an actual prince. Sing it, Susan Burst, who care? While the trio perform Trophy Boy, a decent bop to be honest, and the only song we will hear in the proceedings that is in any way memorable, we get our first real glimpse of Felipe as he cuts a swath through the kingdom, capturing the hearts of every woman he comes across and earning the wrath of their significant others. Oh, 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 my gosh, oh my Therein lies the movie's first sin, as Felipe is a pretty awful protagonist. For reasons which will be explained shortly, Felipe was cursed at birth to be irresistibly charming. Any woman who comes within striking distance of his eyes and smile is immediately infatuated and believes he loves her exclusively. The movie would have us believe that Felipe is perturbed by this situation, as it makes forging a genuine relationship with anyone somewhat difficult. Every girl I've ever met was hypnotized. That's not love. It's meaningless. 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 There's a big echo in my head. But actions speak louder than words, and Felipe's are screaming Antichrist, what an asshole, at the top of their lungs. Characters who are laboring under unwanted magical influence usually make efforts to mitigate it. The title character in Ella Enchanted is compelled to obey any direct order, but she manages a degree of independence by exploiting loopholes and ambiguous wording. Likewise, in Frozen, Elsa's parents try hard to get her ice powers under control, and although they go about it in the worst possible way, the attempt is made. Felipe doesn't go to a great deal of effort to avoid causing women to fall for him, and in fact seems to actively enjoy their attention most of the time. He's also a feckless fail son who spends most of the movie in blissful incompetence while other characters around him do the hard work. King Charming is rather frustrated that his son has every man in the kingdom out for his blood and every woman in the kingdom out for other parts of his body, and is engaged to three separate princesses, which sounds to me like a recipe for a huge diplomatic disaster. He declares that the solution for this mess is for Felipe to undertake the gauntlet. The gauntlet. A perilous journey to Fire Mountain, which, if done properly, will reveal the prince's true love, and which also figures heavily in the movie's backstory. See, a young King Charming did the gauntlet and hooked up with the late queen as a result, but unbeknownst to him, his trusted guide, Nemini Neverwish, harbored feelings for him and became madly jealous when he fell for another. As a result, she turned to dark magic and vowed revenge on the king and love itself. So yeah, here's another plot where everything is the fault of a bitter, envious woman. Good to know that there are some fairy tale tropes we're playing straight. 
Nemini makes her move on the day baby Felipe gets his official visit from the Royal Blessing Fairy, who looks like he would be voiced by John Ratzenberger if this were a Pixar movie. You shall always be charming! Nemini declares that Felipe's curse will come to completion on his 21st birthday, at which point all love will die. Too easy. The only way to break it is a standard protocol true love's kiss on that same birthday, which is three days away, hence why Felipe has been proposing to every princess in a three kingdom radius in order to find the right girl. But King Charming is tired of his son's cavalier attitude and tosses him out on his keister, ordering him to run the gauntlet and find his true love already. All right, let's go gauntleting. It's gonna be... guntastic. Every time he opens his mouth, I hate him more. But let's leave him for now and join a royal armored carriage coming across a fallen log in the middle of the road, which is like page one of the Bandit Ambush Handbook. And sure enough, while they're dealing with the obstacle, an unseen thief uses a trap door and an impressive array of hardware to lift the treasure chest inside, before getting the standard pull back the hood and gasp it's a woman introduction. Billy. You've earned this. 20%. <laughs> Fine, 40%. You can talk to birds. The thief, one Lenore Quinones, according to her wanted poster, is quickly discovered and must flee the guards all the way to Disney Shoutout Village, where Felipe is acting exactly like the fate of the entire kingdom doesn't rest on his shoulders. Ah, my Arabian princess, your genie has appeared. It's perhaps inevitable that any fractured fairy tale movie will include a few nods to the mouse, but this one makes it really forced and unfunny. It's on the same level as the Friedberg Seltzer movies of the late 2000s, where the jokes amounted to, look, it's popular movie character. Lenore bumps into Philippe, meet cute style, and he's all, ooh, she's wearing trousers and is not like other girls, I'm instantly intrigued. So much so that his ability to come up with a good pickup line completely fails him. Say something that makes sense. Very nice, milady. This is nice. And so are we. <laughs> Lenore is in fact not like other girls, as she proves shockingly immune to the prince's cursed charm. And his, don't mind me, I'm just stressed because an evil fairy is going to turn the world into a loveless hearscape unless I can figure out which of my three fiancés I'm supposed to marry, doesn't impress either. I've got a charm that just won't let go. Um. It's such a curse. <laughs> That's it, Lenore is instantly my favorite character. She ducks the guards by hiding out in a bakery, and guess who should walk in but the princesses themselves. What follows is an extended scene where Lenore lifts everything shiny and valuable off the princesses' persons while they recount their stories. And if you've ever encountered any kind of lol fairy tales are kind of weird, aren't they, meta commentary, then you've heard every single joke in this section. Oh, thank goodness my future husband managed to find me because I am apparently the only girl in my entire kingdom with a size six and a half foot. Wow, that is one seriously messed up story. And I know the basic premise of this story indicates that these ladies aren't exactly in their right minds, but that only goes so far to explain their characterization, which is sin number four. They're all built from the same mean girl template. It's almost as if writer-director Ross Venacor thinks superficial, materialistic, and man-hungry is just a woman's default state. What little character distinctions they are given only exist to demonstrate why they're unsuitable candidates for Felipe's true love. Cinderella is pushy and impatient, Sleeping Beauty keeps falling asleep, really original there, and Snow White is kind of deeply traumatized. Um. Let's try some props. Will you accept this apple? Ah, no apple! No, wait! <laughs> it's funny because multiple attempts on her life have left her with severe PTSD, and now she's no longer marriage material. <laughs> anyway, Lenore distracts the princesses from the sudden loss of their accessories by asking to see a portrait of their beloved. And nearly 20 minutes after the setup, we get the payoff. Are you guys hoping to marry the same prince? <laughs> Lenore tries to get away but runs right into a guard, 
instantly losing all her built-up badass cred, and after a completely unnecessary newspaper exposition sequence, we find her in the dungeon with assorted kings, fairy godmothers, and dwarves angry at her. Yes, dears, I'm working on it. And I thought I had problems. The charming curse. Well, it's one tough enchantment, isn't it? Dot magic from Neverwitch. If you're wondering why the fairy godmother sounds like a Monty Python pepper pot, it's because she's voiced by John Cleese, which makes this yet another way he's managed to trash his legacy over the past several years. Anyway, her magic is no use against the curse, so everyone is pinning their hopes on Felipe completing the gauntlet. Lenore uses that to her advantage, as Felipe is so very obviously not cut out for the task, and cuts a deal with the princess's guardians. Three big piles of treasure and her freedom in exchange for getting Felipe to Fire Mountain on time and in one piece. As there are still bounty hunters combing the area for her, and the movie wants to add unnecessary complications to the romance it's trying to develop, Lenore declares she will be helping the prince in disguise. So, with a fake mustache, floppy hat, and absolutely zero attempt at breast binding, she approaches Felipe and offers her services. Well, I was thinking of hiring one of these ruffians to guide me through it. This one was a little too aggressive. Real pain in the... <clears throat> She certainly was immune to all of my charms. Felipe and Lenore, or Lenny as she's now styling herself, set out, but his status as a royal load instantly grates on Lenore to the point where she contemplates shooting him in the back. A temptation that, in my official capacity as a minion of hell, I fully encourage her to give in to. They also have ideological differences, as Felipe accuses Lenny of only being interested in treasure, and Lenore points out the stupidity of proposing to every princess he comes across. When you're born a prince, you marry a princess. I have to find one who truly loves me to break this curse. So, I just keep proposing to them one after another. That's an extremely stupid justification, but Felipe is exactly the sort of idiot who would think like that. Also, Cinderella wasn't a princess until after she married into it, but never mind. We get a lot of exposition in this section, as Felipe explains what the gauntlet entails. Cross an impassable pass, survive an unsurvivable attack, conquer an unconquerable beast, and take a blind leap of faith with your true love. Lenore provides her backstory, which is that she was raised at sea by pirates, put a pin on that, we'll come back to it later, who taught her to never trust anybody. And with all the weak attempts at rapport between the characters, it takes them a long time to notice they've entered an ominously foggy forest, and the local flora is behaving in a very sinister manner. Charlie! What is it, girl? Oh, her horse is named Charlie. I get it. Uh -huh. Felipe continues to be useless, but Lenore's skills with a bow get them through until they come to a cliff where they survive by... Ah! Ah! Um, a uh, geyser turning their cart into a hot air balloon? Sure, let's go with that. This is the part of the movie where our main characters are supposed to reveal their hidden depths and start to like each other, but sin number five is that it never really becomes believable. Philippe doesn't have any hidden depths. He's a self-absorbed man-child throughout the movie, except at the end, where we need to pretend he's actually learned something. There's no reason why Lenore should trust him more than anyone else she's encountered, and certainly no reason for her to make her rethink her assumption that she's better off on her own. As Felipe's first swordplay lesson sends their improvised airship into the forest below, Nemini spies on them from afar, sees through Lenore's disguise... I know, not the most impressive feat, and is enraged to realize she's immune to Felipe's charms. So Nemini starts taking a slightly more direct hand in the proceedings, redirecting them onto a path where Felipe, naturally, instantly stumbles into trouble. Yes, but with every new step, there is hope. <laughs> but not that step. The duo are now captives of the Matilija, forest giants who nobody has ever encountered and lived to tell the tale. As it happens, all the Matilija are women, so this is a problem that Felipe, for once, is actually equipped to handle. Sometimes is a curse and a blessing. 
The Matilija take them to the tribal village, where there's a lot of drumming and stomping, and Felipe finds himself claimed by the Matilija's chief. Uh, what happened to my friend? The ugly one with the bad mustache. He will not be anointed. However, as a special wedding gift to you, he will also not be eaten. Until breakfast! So, let's review. Our heroes are now the captives of savage, painted, largely dark-skinned cannibals, and Felipe is forced to endure the very unwelcome attentions of their leader, who happens to be the only member of her tribe not built like a rail. As for Lenore, she's held in the hut of the Half-Oracle, a Matilija who is only blind in one eye and therefore sees the future with 50% accuracy. She doesn't really contribute much to the plot and is mainly an excuse for Sia to have a weird cameo, and an even weirder acid sequence song. And I, I see your infinite and I, I see your definite. You push that shape shifting smile. I think we all know this is far from the worst thing Sia's ever done in this court, so let's move on. After the tribe has fallen asleep, Felipe gets to work on a rescue plan, mostly at the insistence of Lenore's cardinal pal, Illy. The dagger. Good idea. You can talk to birds. With the aid of the chief's hairpin slash sword, Felipe manages to free Illy and Lenore, but the half-oracle sounds the alarm and sends the Matilija in pursuit, sending the heroes careening into a ravine where they're in danger of having the ceiling stomped down on them. Conveniently, an escape route opens before Lenore can divulge her secret identity, and thus part two of the gauntlet is taken care of. But Nemini is still trying to keep some semblance of villain cred, and decides to try temptation as a diversionary tactic. That is definitely mine. You sure this is a good idea? We cannot allow false temptations to distract us now. It's just a colorful rock, Lenny. <laughs> Maybe to you, Felipe, you're a prince. Your family probably has an entire room of shiny rocks at pilfered from other countries. Meanwhile, that represents a nice retirement plan for Lenore. I'm on her side here. Dislodging the ruby awakes a giant rock monster, which Felipe recognizes as the unconquerable beast of the gauntlet and prepares to battle. With predictable results. No. Felipe realizes the monster is attracted to the gem. He doesn't get points for that, it's stupidly obvious, and even then he gets smacked around for a couple minutes before he hits on the even more stupidly obvious solution, all while Lenore pretends this is somehow romantic. Really Could the answer I gave up finding so long ago truly be as simple as a blind leap and a little faith that I'll be caught? Finally, Felipe puts the gem back where it belongs, and Fire Mountain is within range. But Lenore now feels conflicted about her task, as it means losing Felipe to one of the princesses. So she decides to tell him the truth by setting up a dinner date. There's a village right at the foot of Fire Mountain, doing remarkably well for a place you have to go through an entire gauntlet to get through, then changing into a nice dress while singing an incredibly dull song. Nothing seems to scare you, girl. With the exception of Trophy Boy, none of the songs really feel connected to the narrative. They're just kind of there. And in this case, underscoring a dream sequence that really makes me wish I were watching Beauty and the Beast instead. Now there was a self-absorbed prince who knew how to do character development. Felipe arrives at the rendezvous and for once makes an attempt to avoid attracting the attention of the women present. It doesn't help that Nemini is trying to throw a wrench into Lenore's plan by magically drawing the women to him, but I'm sure Felipe remains committed to his current goal and... Now that I've conquered the unconquerable, this prince must choose his princess. Immediately starts basking in their attention and bragging about marrying a princess just as Lenore walks in. This is how utterly inept this script is. It can't even do the tired, convoluted, this isn't what it looks like relationship complication right, because this is exactly what it looks like. Nemini isn't tricking Lenore, she's showing Lenore exactly who Felipe is and she should believe it. Lenore walks away muttering about how she's a fool because Felipe is destined to wed a princess and not a nobody like her, 
and not, you know, because he's an absolute dick who, if he weren't magically irresistible to every woman he encounters, would be lurking in the darkest corners of a dating service app. She decides to just get her job over with, and Felipe, sleeping off a hangover and being generally oblivious, supports the wisdom of that strategy. Oh, is this because I finished all the pancakes? No. And the coffee? No. And the trail mix? No! Lenore gives Felipe a much-deserved lecture about how he really doesn't understand anything about love or women, before leading him into the Fire Mountain Cave, where she collects her payment and reveals her identity to him. It was her all along. This is weird. Love is blind. I mean, sure, if you ignore the fact that Felipe never really got to know Lenore in either of her identities, and was still being a self-absorbed ass to her less than three minutes ago, that works. But Lenore walks away, and Felipe, convinced that his chance at true love is now gone forever, decides that the only way to break the curse is for him to die before it can be fulfilled. There's not really any reason to believe that will work, but hey, I'm willing to give it a shot. But before his execution, Felipe writes form letters to every woman he's encountered, explaining that he found his true love and he wants her to be happy. But Illy snatches one of the missives and delivers it to the alone with her empty wealth Lenore as proof of Felipe's affections. I found my true love. <gasps> Me. Fortunately for her, but unfortunately for us, Felipe gets an unearned speech where he apologizes for the heartbreak he caused, and the executioner takes his own sweet time getting the job done, allowing Lenore to come to the rescue. But Nemini isn't finished yet, as she unleashes a healthy dose of fog and drama. Tell me. What part of Doom to Never Love do you not understand? That is your curse, not mine. In my position as judge of this court, I find it generally preferable to make the case against the defendant through rhetorical techniques, rather than resorting to fits of histrionic rage. However, every so often I am left with no choice but to say, THIS MAKES NO FUCKING SENSE! 1. Why would Nemini curse someone in a way that might counter a curse she already has in action? 2. Why would a character whose entire motivation is that she resents love to the point of wanting to eradicate it entirely consider the inability to feel love a curse? She'd be more likely to count that as a net positive. 3. Ross Venicor, you had a good magic workaround right in front of you and you completely missed it. Lenore explains that she was raised at sea, and as it stands, that's a pointless detail. But if the wording of Nemini's curse had been tweaked to say that every woman of the land would fall for Felipe, then Lenore's not belonging to the land because she grew up on a ship could explain her immunity and four, get rid of the unsettling implication that her independent nature is somehow an aberration that needs to be corrected. It just... Stupid! Stupid! <sighs> Felipe's leap of blind faith comes in when he takes a magic blast in the back to save Lenore, and if he just died now, we could get a decent bittersweet ending out of this. But no, this is really a fairy tale at heart, and good old true love's kiss comes in to save the day, destroy Nemini, break the curse, and bring the sun out. Hold on, look at them. Good people! Is there anything you want me to say to him? Like what? Like... Will you marry me, Prince Felipe Charming? Aha, uh -huh, see, Lenore is not your typical princess because she's the one who proposed to him. And also she gives away all her money because Felipe showed her there are more important things than treasure, which by the way is a really sanctimonious statement for a royal to make. Besides, she doesn't need financial independence now that she's securely married and pregnant and knitting baby booties like a proper wife. And sweet Lucifer, I hate this movie so... Much! Perhaps the worst part about Charming is that the basic idea, under different circumstances, might have made a decent movie. If the title character had any real depth or character arc, if the story actually played with familiar tropes and stories rather than just noting their existence, if anybody involved had any idea how to write a woman character. But, well, 
There's no use going on about what might have been, is there? Sorry, don't mind me. The Court of Musical Hell condemns writer-director Ross Venecor to learn some respect for the fairy tales he wishes to satirize by experiencing some of the darker fates outlined in them. I think a bit of dancing in red-hot shoes or birds pecking out eyes might give him some perspective. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court and Musical Hell is now adjourned. (laughs) 